Hello and welcome to What Should Have Been The Village. So in this video we're continuing in our mini series looking at the presence of God through the Bible. In the previous video we were thinking about this through the tabernacle which was constructed under Moses where the presence of God was able to dwell among the people of Israel in the tabernacle as they travelled. Now we're fast forwarding to the books of Samuel, Kings and Chronicles looking at the temple in Jerusalem and how through it God was able to be in relationship with his people and what this means uh, for us today in our relationship with God and how this differs from then. The tabernacle was built as a tent which would move around with the people of Israel as they traveled through the wilderness in which the glory of God was able to dwell among them. However, when we get to the book of Samuel and the people of Israel have firmly established themselves in a more permanent location, King David desired to build a more permanent place to represent God's presence among the people. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2, David says to his prophet Nathan, See now I dwell in the house of a cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. David is basically saying, How can I live in a permanent house of my own, yet God's house on earth is somewhere temporary? In some ways, it's a bit like when a new church is planted, and at first it starts off in a cafe or a community centre, somewhere not owned by the church, and it may move around between different locations. However, as the church grows and it gains enough resources to build its own building and to have somewhere more permanent to expand its ministry. So the movement from tabernacle to temporal temple is similar to this in that it created a permanent location. However, in this circumstance, it was concerned about a permanent representation of God's dwelling, God dwelling at the center of his people. However, later in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, God forbids David building the temple because he is, he is God and he will decide when the temple should be built. Instead, God promises to build up David's line and that his son would be the one to build the temple. In response to this, David is deeply grateful to the Lord and acknowledges how great God is in comparison to him and how much God has done for him and the people of Israel. So we fast forward to the book of Kings. David has died and now King Saul and his son is on the throne. And between 1 Kings chapters 5 to 8 and in 2 Chronicles chapters 2 to 7, we learn of how Solomon and the Israelites prepared, built and dedicated the temple. Now to give you a time frame of of when this actually is. Um, it's quite a lot of time since uh, the Israelites have actually left Egypt. We're told in Kings that the construction of the temple began 480 years after the exodus from Egypt. The temple itself is twice the size of the tabernacle, but despite this and it being grander and more permanent than the tabernacle, the basic structure is the same. The temple is similarly split into three se sections, a vestibule, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Interestingly, this isn't too dissimilar from many other Middle Eastern temples which existed at the time. However, the big difference with the Temple of Israel was that there were no idols inside it. Rather, rather at its center was the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments, which encompassed the will of God for his people. Therefore, God's word was at the heart of the temple. God says to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, that concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David your father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So basically, if the people of Israel follow the will of God and are in relationship with him, his presence will be with them in the temple at the heart of Jerusalem. After the temple is constructed, the arrival of God's presence is signified through the Ark of the Covenant being brought to the temple. When this happens, people are praising God through singing, playing trumpets and other musical instruments. And God showed his approval of this and affirmed his presence through filling the temple with a cloud of glory. God further displayed his approval of the temple and his presence within the temple after the it was dedicated by Solomon. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, uh, this time fire comes down from heaven and consumes the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord fills the temple. And when the people of Israel see this, uh, they bow down and, and worship God. <laughs> 
These events in the opening of the temple are very similar to what happens when God reveals his presence to the Israelites earlier at the tabernacle, where a similar glory cloud enters the tabernacle and a pillar of fire leads the Israelites through the wilderness. In both these events and locations, we see that God's presence dwells among his people and he is in relationship with them. However, just like the tabernacle, God's presence is still fixed to one location at the temple. While some worship like prayers and songs could still happen outside of the temple, sacrifices had to be taken, undertaken at the temple, as doing this in other places violated the Lord's will. So we still see that while God is pleased with this new temple and that the people of Israel could still be in relationship with him, his presence remained in one location and restricted to one people. But today, thankfully for us, this is not the case. Because God has given us Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. If you remember when this moment happens in the Gospels, the curtain in the temple is torn in two. This signifies that non-Jews, which is us, are now able to be in relationship with God. In addition, uh, unlike during the times of the temple, there is no fixed location for God's presence on earth. In Hebrews 9 and 10, it talks about how Jesus has fulfilled the temple and its sacrificial systems and there is no longer any need for a singular place to worship God. Therefore God's presence today unlike the times in the Old Testament is no longer fixed to any specific point on earth and we can be in close relationship with God because of the work which Jesus has done for us and we can now worship him whenever and wherever. Um, so now we will pray to close. Uh, God thank you um, uh, that you have looked after your people through history and provided a, a place uh, for them to worship but thank you that uh, today we can worship you freely and even though we're not Jews we can still worship you and there is no set place for us to worship you and even though it is good to come together and, and worship you fully we can still do that by ourselves uh, we thank you for sending your son uh, in order that we can do that and we pray these things in your name Amen